welcome to Diversify with the Art Bank and Canadian Culture. I'm Pat Sullivan, Public Programs Officer here, and I'm up, up here to give you an outline of our event tonight. Diversify, the Art Bank and Canadian Culture, relates to our exhibition, The Art Bank in the 21st Century, of which you'll hear more a bit later this evening. Our exhibition features a selection of contemporary work acquired by the Canada Council Art Bank since 2001 and reflects the impact of two special calls for works by First Nations, Inuit, and ethnically diverse artists. The Art Bank's mandate for acquisition is excellence, representation, and rentability. Considering this, our panel tonight will discuss cultural diversity, interdisciplinarity in contemporary art practices, and the efficacy of government policies in these areas. In a moment, I'll introduce the moderator, Barbara Neely, who will in turn introduce our panel, Ashok Mathur, Andrea Fatona, and Brendan Fernandez. We're very grateful that they have all agreed to participate. Each panelist will give a brief presentation, and then we'll be opening up, Barbara will open it up to questions and a dialogue uh, with the audience. You'll notice that we are filming this event, so we do need our questioners to use microphones when you ask a question, and we'll make those available to you. After this program wraps up, we can all enjoy the reception to celebrate the Art Bank exhibition, at which point Jan Allen, our acting director, will offer some remarks. Barbara Manili is a visual artist whose site-responsive work engages the landscapes and histories of mainstream Canadian nation. Barbara has taught at the University of Regina, the First Nations University of Canada, and currently teaches at Queen's, where she is also a doctoral candidate in cultural studies. I'd like to thank Barbara for arranging Ashok Mathur's visit and for approaching the Art Centre for collaboration on this. So please join me in welcoming Barbara Manila. has exhibited widely, nationally, and internationally. 
wide and common, national common and international. <laughs> of the New Commissions Project Through Art in General in New York in 2010 and was the Ontario representative for the 2010 Soviet Art Award. So thanks everyone for coming. It's a delight to see you all again and to meet you all again. So we're going to start. Andrea's going to join me up here. So uh, let's see where we go from there. So we'll, each person will speak and then we'll have a discussion. I'll have some questions for all of this. <laughs> Thanks for coming out, and um, I'd like to thank the organizers of the event, um, particularly Barbara, Pat, Ben, Cindy, and Jan, for inviting me to participate in the panel. Um, today, what I'd like to do is to talk to you about what I would call a history of the present in relation to issues of revolution and the Canadian Council. Um, much of my uh, observations that I'll make tonight based on my research um, on British Life the implementation of British Life Policies at the Canada Council between 1989 and 1999. Um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge Vicky Henry for her vision um, regarding diversifying the holdings of the RCA. Um, having said that, I'd also like to talk about um, the fact that this diversification really took place starting in 2001 and the second purchase took place in 2008. There some questions about what that says about the ways in which racial equity actually gathered or galvanized or gathered traction at the council. So I'd like to make a couple of observations or work through a couple of ideas in this presentation. First, I'd like to say that the process of racial equity <coughs> Formation at the Canada Council in the 19, beginning in um, 1989, uh, was a messy one and a really contentious one. Um, the issues arose around the framework on which policy should be grounded. Um, the contention was really about the framework, whether or not it ought to be a multicultural slash diversity paradigm or one that was concerned with anti racism. Just want to bring up a slide to start. Just want to keep the slide up here to um, get our attention on the the ideologies that grounded, or and I think still grounds or circumscribes the exclusion of racialized evidence from original artists and original producers from um, the narratives of, of the Canadian nation. So start the history of the present with a massive effect. Um, the report made explicit the hierarchies and worth ascribed to cultural expression and products of various racial and ethnic groups in Canada <coughs> in the 1950s by privileging art forms based on European traditions. The commissioners uh, discussion on Indian art, as you can see up here, and the cultural contributions of groups from other European ethnicities illustrate what I think is racist thinking behind how First Nations cultures were viewed by the commissioners. Um, the obliteration of Aboriginal art, I believe, from the legitimate, the legitimate categories of Canadian art permitted uh, the commissioners, as well as um, Canadian citizens, to imagine and produce reference that gestured back to European conventions and logics. And in a way, I'd say that that type of a logic created a space in which um, sectors were hampered by the ghosts of the First Nations other. And this obliteration also suggests to me that modern culture and contemporary art were only shaped by values um, of, of the European. And those values were really about a kind of universalist understanding of um, culture and one that tried to transcend issues of difference. It also allowed for a real deepening of European culture and art as dominant in a manner that I'd call, and, and folks like Foucault would call, the order of cultural things. So we'll start with that as I believe as a grounding, as a really um, deeply uh, forming the ways in which we think about who produces art in this country. Um, the Massey Commission also went on to state um, that they were really quite impressed with uh, the artworks of other Europeans, primarily in terms of things like uh, genres like ballet, 
And uh, Paul Gilroy, in his writing, talks about where the sociological thinking comes from. And he argues that blacks and First Nations uh, subjects are seriously positioned in relation to the realm of our Gilroy argues that Europeans have imagined and constructed blacks as infantile, unable to move from a stage of object fictionism uh, to abstraction. While First Nations peoples are disappeared from the modern era and included in a time before history, which means that First Nations African people do not need art. At the time, um, these uh, ideas were circulating. Uh, Canadian immigration <coughs> law acts actually did not permit or did not favor immigrants from non European backgrounds. So you can understand what the demographics of Canada looks like at that time. So I'm going to move on from that just to set the stage for where I believe much of our thinking about who produces Canadian culture and who actually narrates the nation visually. Um, where that kind of thinking is grounded. I'm going to talk about a little bit about culture and representation. I talk about the years uh, from the 80s to the 90s. So the mid 80s saw a wave of advocacy and lobbying activities that were driven primarily by independent First Nations artists, artists of color, and cultural workers right across the country. Artists of color and First Nations artists uh, form coalitions and organize separately to advance their cause. Cultural producers of color and First Nation, their First Nations counterparts were demanding that cultural institutions, including the Canada Council, address and ameliorate inequities in the cultural sphere. Questions were being posed about who produced art, um, what it meant to be Canadian, uh, what defined artistic merit, as well as who was being privileged as creators of Canadian art and culture. And so we have people like Barbara Phillip, Richard Fung, Monica Gagnon, uh, to name a few who were actually writing, but also um, engaged in activist activity and advocacy activities at the Canada Council, but also on the ground in terms of grassroots uh, activism. So in short, I think there was, in short, the received notions of Canada's commitment to cultural diversity in the arts that emerged following the Bicultural and Bilingual Commission were being subjected to close scrutiny by artists and racialized cultural producers. Again, racialized artists requesting cultural institutions for their exclusion, They're really questioning um, uh, cultural institutions for the racism that kept them outside of, of the frame of Canada. Um, for artists of color, really the tenets of Trudeau's multiculturalism, policies of the 60s and 70s that espoused citizen participation did not come to fruition. Why didn't it come to fruition? Artists of color and uh, First Nations um, uh, <coughs> artists and cultural producers were drawing from the well of multicultural um, funding, primarily from the Secretary of State, um, Citizenship and Multicultural Branches and Branch, and later from the Department of Canadian Heritage for Ethnocultural Activities. These activities became, artists of color came to realize that the criteria for funding was limited in the definition of what it meant to be from a specific, specific ethnocultural community. So in a sense, what was being funding is what we could fund it was the song and dance of, of these, of these um, ethnocultural communities. So this is what really spurred on what I, in my own research, call the diversity years, as I stated before, between uh, 1989 and 1999. So over the period of the early 80s, a significant um, amount of transformation was taking place at the Canada Council in relation to its practices of inclusion. Uh, women were being, inc being included in juries. Um, spurred on by um, grassroots movements of feminism. Um, so at the time we saw women participating in juries. And at the same time, we had the um, Abamon Herbert Report that really um, placed diversity into the framework of the Canada <coughs> Council. And in that report, diversity is referred to as the distinctness of cultural and geographical um, regions in Canada, but also to ethnicities and races other than English and French. 
the council positioned uh, diversity, the council's position of diversity is really, really clearly stated. Sorry, clearly steered by the institutions. It was clearly steered by the institutions' relationship to the government. Primarily around the, uh, the implementation of the Multiple <coughs> Act of 1989, but also other acts like the Employment Equity Act. Um, these really, because the Canada Council is an armed land agency um, of the government, these, these acts came to impact directly on the Council's activities. Equity became one of the, the Council's priorities in the late 80s, and a commitment was made to serve serve visible minority artists and First Nations <laughs> artists. Because, again, uh, discussions within the council for, and for its needs for policy was being spared as well by um, contestation <coughs> in the community. So council didn't actually get out of, uh, and out of its altruism and say, we're going to actually include diversity in our policies. It was um, uh, a kind of push-pull from, from the community, as well as an internal um, shift at the council. Both things, I believe, were necessary for, this implement, for the implementation of racial equity policies. So 1989, Chris Brayton County was uh, um, hired as the first racial equity um, coordinator at the council. And at that time, he drew together a group of uh, senior artists, racialized artists, to serve as the first um, racial equity advisory committee. Joyce Stevens, the director of the council, as well, was very instrumental in pushing ahead issues of racial equity. And I guess what I'd like to point out, as well as part of my discussion or part of my talk, is that racial equity at the council was, and I think is still driven very much by the will of individuals. Policy itself has not actually pushed things forward. It's a commitment of primarily senior management and directors that actually allows for equity to actually have some teeth. And also by people like Ruby Henry, who um, out of uh, understanding <coughs> and for um, diversity when they aren't events, collection to the one herself to actually coordinate that purchase and work directly with the equity office to make that happen. The other thing that took place within this messiness of um, the Canada Council development and racial equity was a lot of discussion and actually tension again around, as I said, the frameworks out of which racial equity should take place. So multiculturalism was seen as diluting issues that needed to be addressed, really issues of race, issues of racism. Um, I'll just read from here. So members of the committee engage in discussion on the terms of multiculturalism and the importance of incorporating an anti-racist framework within the, frame, within the work of the committee and council. Anti-racist principles and practices developed in the context of grassroots organizing challenge the pluralistic notions of what, we've, what, what we understand to be diversity. And what it does, it really actually engages issues of color and issues around racism and its effect on racialized bodies. That way of thinking and that paradigm is dropped, primarily because Joyce Stevens saw it as being counterproductive to the board of the Canada Council really accepting the shift at the council. So the ideas around anti-racism and the redistribution of um, of, of our resources was actually swept to the side. And I believe that this actually continues to haunt us today in relation to issues of equity, um, issues of true change in relation to understanding the hierarchies and the kinds of exclusions that take place within the Canada Council, within the larger um, societal framework that affects cultural producers who are non-European. Um, I think I'll leave it there, but what I'd like to say is I'd like to talk about the ways in which this idea of uh, race and racism have been um, reinvigorated in a way through this discussion that Mark Mayer had in relation to the purchase that was made. Mark Mayer was asked, um, I'll show you the video, but let me just read a little bit. 
Right. Working on that idea. So say a new debate has um, arisen in relation to equity and race applicants. And I think at the, uh, the heart of this new debate is this idea of excellence. And the ways in which excellence is actually um, dredged up to actually exclude. So, in Mark Mayer's discussion, what we see again is the question about who produces art in this country. Um, and I think it's been, uh, this, you know, the concept of excellence is being deployed as a benchmark to talk about what is good art. And it involves a register that really actually resides within a, a European, Western art. Uh, paradigm that has at its roots a real exclusionary, um, absolutely an exclusionary way. What becomes clear from the CDC report, which I'll play um, in a second, is that mainstream cultural institutions such as the National Gallery, and I won't just only single out the National Gallery, mainstream cultural institutions um, remain relatively untouched by the racial equity policies at the Canada Council. So in a way, it hasn't quite filtered down. Um, certain institutions take it up, while others choose to turn away from it. The Council, although it's led the way for the opening up of other art forms and other communities, um, there's still issues, in it, particularly around the fact that I get one just uh, state that we've had two purchases, one in 2001 and one in 2008, that I believe were really kind of more individually driven um, based on the will of a few people. So the question for me is how do we allow, how do we uh, create policy that matters, as uh, Clyde Robertson's uh, title of his book uh, refers to. Policy does matter, but how do we give it to I believe we can have some of that discussion here tonight. Um, the problem of multiculturalism and the multicultural is still strongly debated uh, in the current moment, and it has impli impl sorry, implications for the continued understanding of racial equity in the arts. Based on the histories of Canadian settlement, I would suggest that we need to do Canada as a country of many centuries and many margins. which in turn produces a diverse, diverse range of cultural expressions with specific geographical and regional spaces. I think this way, a view of the Canadian nation would unhinge from the notion of a unified Canadian art that can be produced, allowing specificities of art and culture to take shape in a more robust form. In a way, I think I'm advocating for a form of regionalism that is shaped by Canada's growing cosmopolitan populations and sensibilities. And in a way, also extending what uh, Nancy Fraser's argument on resource redistribution is that if we actually shifted our understanding of Canadian art, then we would actually place equality and justice at the center of this debate. So we move away from a diversity paradigm, we would understand this as a social justice uh, issue, and think through ways in which policy can assist us in um, uh, redistributing resources. So on that note, I'm going to play. <coughs> <Okay. coughs> okay. First of all, I, I want to thank uh, Barb particularly for, um, for inviting me for this uh, visiting scholar um, uh, week and it's been quite a bit. It's my last uh, last gig, and uh, I, I think I'm going to need a drink right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait. I'll wait. Uh, it's been a wonderful week and being able to do this. I, I was saying to some of the, uh, the the students I was talking to earlier that um, uh, unusual for me I, I, that we actually drove across the country this time to Vancouver. Uh, we were going to go to stop at Sault Ste. Marie and then coming to Toronto, so I uh, took the train out here. So I've been on the ground the entire time, and one thing that uh, occurred to me, and as I was looking at the first, first slide that uh, Andrew had up around the uh, kind of death of, uh, the death of Aboriginal uh, art was to recognize 
the lands we traverse and what we're on all the time. One of our experiences we went to, um, I work in Canada, so right now I went to uh, uh, there for the first day for Vancouver, Canada. We just met with a number of uh, Ashwaka artists, but also um, that's, the, that's the territory I'm working on now, and I'm, I'm cognizant of that. And from there we went, and the next day we, uh, we got as far as, uh, as Brooks, but before we got there we stopped at Old Sun uh, Community College, which used to be Old Sun Residential School. That was the first place I ever taught uh, when it was a community uh, outreach program for the University of Calgary. I just got my master's degree and I, and I was in the space. And uh, we talked the other day about the, um, the in, a, in a reading group that I was part of, the inhabitation of these spaces by the ghosts, the hauntings of the past. And, and it was true, you go to the old sun, and when I taught there, I thought there's something odd about this place. We're in the basement, and it was uh, one of the things that struck me with the bars and the windows, which of course are ostensibly, ostensibly keep people out, people who break in, but it also had this deep imprisoning, imprisoning factor to it. Uh, the broken urinals, the, the, the feelings of the walls inside, what they would say. Um, so, driving across the country, realizing we're traversing Aboriginal territory every step of the way. Some trees, some non tree, we're always on it. And, uh, and I thought, well, what does that mean in terms of our, our, uh, the discursive relationship we have with the land? And what does that mean uh, in terms of artistic production? Because if art is um, a reflection and a manifestation of who we are, who we are embodied in the space, I have been not uh, not involve those, those, those multiple and multifaceted histories. Anyway, um, I also want to thank uh, Andrew for that uh, wonderful um, uh, introduction and always listening to you that to, to see the, the, the intellectual threads being brought in to, to a place that makes it much easier for me to speak because uh, I have uh, not nearly the substance to, to deliver, so I'll just be having some fun. And then, and then and Brendan will follow me, will also have a lot of uh, substance and aesthetic. <laughs> So I'm going to be a bit of a, part of this is a bit of a provocateur kind of thing, so you'll see as I go through, and I will, uh, I don't make apology for it, but I'm going to acknowledge that as I start, because I'm going to challenge the questions the way that uh, Andy set it up for us. So three days ago, I was waiting for the elevator inside One King West, now a business class hotel repurposed from the old and magnificent Dominion Bank. The only vestiges of this previous incarnation are a TV ATM at the King Street exit, which I'm pretty sure wasn't there in the original Dominion Bank, and the underground vault, which at one time harbored the variously, variously gotten gains of the Bay Street elite, and its current claim to fame that no less than three Hollywood films have used that subterranean apartment of reinforced steel and glass and special sets. Anyway, I'm waiting for the elevator, and a voice shouts out to distant colleagues, hey, not all bankers are bad, followed by the owner of the voice, a sharply dressed woman who is all Bay Street historism, racing up to join me and on that way dressed business guy as we enter the elevator. She does a quick assessment of her travel companions and rendering me unnaturally attired in these same black jeans and a leather jacket, which she has gracefully put into her office right now, and, uh, and freight line. And it's more or less, less equivalent, uh, I feel more or less equivalent to the elevator panel uh, and the invisibility there. And she turns to the third among us and she says, did you catch what I said? Not all the anchors are that. With such familiarity, that at first I assumed they're old friends, or new acquaintances at the same conference, but clearly that's a misread. And that's about all, and that is all about how we see, how we read, how we construct realities in front of us. Mr. Natalie Dress acknowledges her statement, permitting her to reintroduce introduce herself as one of those not bad bankers, and he to refer to himself as some banking or hedge fund associate. I always use hedge funds when I'm using the example. I, I have to admit I don't like hedge funds. <laughs> So we travel to our various ascendancies, and I depart on the, the, of course, lower floor, left to ponder the articulation of value-ridden bankingness and what I can make of the mix. So what is a bank supposed to do? And if bankers can be not all bad, can banks themselves be up to some good? A bank, I'm told, in financial considerations, takes your money and pays you a small percentage for your troubles, and it loans you money and charges you a significantly higher percentage for its troubles. It trades in money, or the idea of money, since often it 
insert the blues in your pocket. With it then, an art bank. Since 1972, the County Council Art Bank has traded in art, in a manner of speaking. Although instead of citizens depositing art into its vaults, these works are purchased outright to be lent out, rent out, to various government and business denizens of the nation state. Unlike financial versions, the art bank, despite being a fine model of exchange, has few of its executive on the Forbes most wealthy list. And its depositors, the artists, are similarly unlikely to summer on the Riviera while their car rolls in the revenue. Brendan, uh, excuse me, of course. But the point <laughs> is, is, that, is, that, is that, that, that the art bank is to focus on exchange and dissemination, not these get get received. Okay, so it's a bank in a certain name. Now, um, I'm going to go to, to what, what Jan Allen writes on, on, uh, about the art bank. Uh, which was constructed under the banner of democracy and democratization. That's an interesting concept. I, I don't know if I'll touch on it here, but hopefully in the questions we can. And entwines the mandate, she writes, of excellence, representation, and rentability. Uh, in other words, the art bank collects works that is collects work that is perceived as strong, using the county council peer review <coughs> concept. Um, attempts to create a cross-section of, of artistic production in a diversified population. And finally, it's a work that the aforementioned denizens will want to borrow for their stately vaults. Okay, that's a very important thing. I'm going to talk in a moment about that desire. Uh, now, four years ago, the art, no, about 45 years, six years ago, I suppose, the art bank put out the, the call that Sarah Matthews referred to. Um, I thought it was the first special call, but I, you know, you're telling me that it's the second time that they, they've done this. Uh, specifically, a shout out to racialized artists who were underrepresented in this vault. About a third of this acquisition of 55 pieces was shown in the exhibition descriptively titled Diaspora Art, Strategy and Seduction by Canadian Artists from Culturally Diverse Communities in Works from the Collections of the Canada Castle Art Bank, mouthful, at no less than the Governor General's official residence at Regal Hall. The exhi exhibition was described as a window onto the intermingling of cultures in Canada. Through their works, the artists of African, Asian, Middle Eastern, or Latin American origin compare their cultural heritage with Western society and its values while exploring current trends in the visual arts. Um, again, that statement is a challenging one, a bit problematic, but the thing about it is that it's, it's, it's there's an attempt at something here, okay? I want to keep that in the back of our register if we're talking. It was a watershed moment for the art thing, um, both the acquisition and the exhibition. Under the eye of, of then Governor General Michael John, we had a, a spectacular and media rich opening with all the accoutrements of such a gala. Flaming shrimp, decadent desserts, <laughs> and all the brown artists what we hope to consume. <laughs> I say this playfully, like, lightly, and without intending to deride or dismiss the intentionality of the key players. Um, that, again, is referred to the County Council Equity Office, the Art Bank, the Governor General's Office. Like any good curatorial project, Diaspora Art addressed a perceived absence, applied a corrective salve to the Canadian art world, inclusive of both creators and consumers, and I'm not using consumers here in a, in a pejorative way, uh, even if certain gatekeepers and power brokers of this artistic economy were somewhat suspect. And we all remember the, the the Mark Mayer's one we just saw. <laughs> Dubious assertion that sites such as the National Gallery saw only excellence through a colorblind lens, suggesting to the wider community that once the uppity colored folk uh, produced a significant artist or two, the National Gallery would be happy to show them. I'm going to return to this notion of consumption and artistic integrity in a moment, but first, this is my theoretical, my B side of the discussion. Uh, earlier today, I gave a talk in a graduate class in sociology here at Queen's, taught by uh, Dr. Sarita Sarasco. And it touched on the complexities of borders, authoritarian state, race, migration, and terrorism. And in that discussion, I raised an important polemic by Edward Said, who wrote this. Uh, I'm going to read this slowly because it's partly a quote, partly a paraphrasing to get the whole intent in here. Uh, the intellectual's role is dialect generally is dialectically oppositionally to uncover and elucidate the contest between a powerful system of interests and less powerful interests threatened with frustration, silence, incorporation, or extinction by the powerful. To challenge and defeat both an imposed silence and the normalized quiet of unseen power wherever and whenever possible. So essentially, in the quote, it's, uh, it's, it's talking about what so he talks about speaking truth to power, right? To, to push that and to move it at any particular moment. Now, he's talking about intellectuals. Um, he speaks of the academic community. 
But I'd like to expand that argument. Uh, then this new millennium, artists are, can be, and arguably should be, emissaries of socio-political dialogues, enticing engagement and ideas, and teasing out possibilities for living well in the cultural worlds we've inhabited. I use that term, living well, the sense that we cannot be um, inhabitants in, this, in the culture we have unless we can be comfortable in that space. And to be comfortable in that space often means a type of a disturbance and disruption. So I'm going to return to, to John Allen's statement that the art bank was first conceived as an ingenious means of bringing art to the masses through placement in federal government offices, and that today, disciplined by operational strictures of financial self-sufficiency, new works entering the collection straddle the emergent critical practices, representations of national identity, and decor, enabling the art bank to continue showcasing Canada's most accomplished art play, artists and workplaces across the country. So this brings me full circle to the notion of consumption. It's not enough, of course, for the art bank to purchase works that the peer reviewers determine to be critically important and worthwhile. These works must be rentable, okay? That is, consumable by the public. That is, they must fit into a national imaginary. And indeed, the art bank has had to dispose of the past work in the intention, so a work that is deemed unsupported by this renting community it doesn't been shown, so it's been donated to, in my understanding, to private collections and, and, and such government. And it's, a, it's because the government offices or places weren't interested in showing it. Sometimes for technical reasons, you know, moving parts or outdated uh, machinery, but, but uh, we have to recognize that that's, that's the case. So I pose this as a problem. Because as we know from studying market economies, we produce based on what demand dictates. The problem with this in the context of art, particularly in this context of the site book that I just read and to related theories, is that in order to develop a culture of critical inquiry that challenges, disturbs, disrupts, and basically puts the screws to the status quo, quo artists and intellectuals have to produce outside the economy of supply, demand, and consumption. Or bring down the house of capitalism is too severe a challenge. We have to figure out ways to create a demand for those same disruptive behaviors. And you see what I'm talking about here is a kind of sea change in attitude. We have to uh, create an environment not where, um, where it simply becomes an economical decision to put the arts of color and make, us, make a type of equity argument. But, and, and this is Manson and Kim and I'm just talking, we have to be able to figure out a systemic shift in the, in, and, and the, a deep shift in the way we think. Now, I'm going to end here with a few uh, primers. This is for the provocateur side, a few primers for the art bank, uh, and the possibility for the art bank, and for cultural institutions in general, uh, as we barrel forth into the future. One, uh, we have, to, we have to develop new forms and new models of education and edification. The Canadian public has to be served by recognizing that there's a lack in our wants, our collective wants and desires. So we have to nurture a desire to crave the impossible. Now, what that means is uh, we're living in a cultural moment right now where, where uh, we're being told what's, what's possible. And we have to go some of, the, some of the Latin American leaders have talked about demanding the impossible. You look for that which you don't think you, is, is even within the, right, within the radar. You, you demand it many ways. And that's what we have to do, particularly from perspectives of uh, racialization, queer identity, moving things past and into a national national so it's part of that. That's the, that's the, first, the, the first thing. Right? Now, you notice I'm saying these things nicely theoretically. I like doing it this way. But, uh, but we'll, we'll come to that. Uh, and actually, I'm sure Brandon will give us all the answers. Second, um, <laughs> so, yeah, second, attitudinal shifts. Now, I mentioned Dr. Zervas about before, so we discussed. And it's worth noting, she, she, some of you may have seen, she was on a panel on Monday on CBO discussing the, uh, the dearth of diversity on expert panels on news and analysis shows. This is one of those classic TV shows where they're, they're being self-critical, saying, why, why aren't we more diverse? Let's bring people to tell us why we're not diverse. And, and, and that, that's the one show, right? Uh, so the host kept returning to the quantifiable, okay, the acceptable percentages. And Sarita insisted that this was the wrong approach. She said, we don't need more numbers per se. And this is part of the, the systemic problem running into we as, as the host said, okay, so say the population of the is 22% racialized people. If we have 22% on TV, is that enough, right? And she's saying, that's the wrong approach. Right? We don't need more numbers per se. She said, we need to think differently, to desire diversity because because it reflects all that we think and stand for. 
not because we're trying to balance the race ledger, but because it's who we are collectively. So when we see this, and it shouldn't be up to racialized communities, uh, it shouldn't be up to Aboriginal communities to talk about Aboriginal issues. There's got to be, uh, if we are going to talk about an actual national green, uh, instead of the, the nation state, problem as the nation state, we have to find ways for us as citizens to, to change the way we think, change the way we think of the nation, which is, again, it's an excellent big task. And the third and last thing that I'm going to mention here is uh, we have to get this art, banked or otherwise, into a larger spectrum and sector of the Canadian public. Um, as we know, a lot of, I, I, I'm not exactly clear on exactly where all play, the art bank pieces are placed, right? And, and my understanding is much of them go through the Turing exhibitions, uh, federal offices, government offices, and, and, and private offices. Um, but that doesn't really reach a, a large sector of the Canadian population. So even if you look at something like artists around centers, now they're often in the less trendy, more socially bereft side of town. Their audiences are often not inhabited in those same places. Uh, in other words, art remains still, in this day and age, still remains, uh, for the for class elite, to some degree, the purview of the well field. And we have to figure out how to get this work, I'm talking about art bag work, but also the work that's being produced for the public, into the eyes, the souls, and consciousnesses of the masses. To do less, to carry on as we have, to serve us all. So this is, this is I think, the biggest challenge. How do we get art into the, the hands and minds of the masses? And that's, uh, and that's a tricky one. There are places that are doing it and doing it really well. Those communities are often serving uh, in and for themselves within their, their own communities, which is a great thing, I right? don't cry that. But what happens to the, the work, what happens to most of the work that we see in the gallery here today? You know, who is going to be seeing it? How is it going to be seen? Uh, so my final, my final statement, those are my, my, my three uh, um, uh, movements, I suppose, and we'll talk about them later. So let's, let's end with this. It's true that not all bankers are bad. That's only because we work to make it so. It's not happenstance. It's the product of hard work, diligence, and delivery. And in the future of the art bank, in the future of artistic practice inside, and perhaps despite the nation state, this, this is something we have to think about when maybe pushing back against this notion of uh, the state as it reduces things like multiculturalism. And I talked earlier today about the exportation of Canadian multiculturalism as a commodity that, that is good for, for trade. Uh, so we have to be able to push things against despite the nation state, and we have to be able to heed our histories and pick up the challenges that surround us. And so I leave you with the statement that the impossible is possible, but only if we can imagine. So I think I'm going to stop there, and uh, hopefully we'll have time for, for the, uh, really teasing out some of these possibilities at a later moment. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ashok. Uh, Brendan? Yeah, you can totally put the pressure on. <laughs>
something that's consumable or uh, that is in line with being a commodity and object, it then sort of also defines what that kind of art is or what kind of art making that we expect to be in the space. And so um, I'm just sort of questioning those, those limits in the sense of what is being collected. Um, for me, another big thing is the dissemination of how does this thing get disseminated? You know, having the work be exist within uh, bureaucratic office spaces uh, then limits the audience. And I think for us as artists and for a public, you know, we want work to gain its recognition. We want its, we want its questions to be asked to by many people and for that to create something that um, allows it to then further develop. And I think that that limits, and I think it also speaks to a certain demographic, a certain kind of person that also expects art to look this way, art to be this way. And, uh, and then when you put it into a specific kind of call and you have the signifiers of iconography, it then sort of gets classified as being in that sort of space of this being diverse art. And I think that that kind of creates further problems within that system. Um, I have some questions for us on the notes here about um, the relevance of, um, of other kinds of spaces that we're seeing now coming up, like the private collection, the private sort of bank, for, for lack of a better word. And like, what do those do? You know, those are you know individuals sort of creating their form of, um, of their collections that will that, that get you know they just form with their own money. So it, it's limiting in its own sense. But I'm questioning the idea of um, what happens when these these private spaces now have their collections, and then also question the idea of what is different between the art bank and something like the National Gallery. What do those two spaces have in common? What, are those, what do those two spaces also uh, have that are different? Um, I'm going to sort of just sort of talk a little bit more then about the question of, of um, diversifying. And I feel that we're talking about trying to define something, trying to define what it means to be different, what it means to be. But that's something that we can't necessarily do. Because we're constantly, and for me at least, I'm sort of thinking from the, from the understanding of Stuart Hall, that cultural identities are something that are constantly in flux, they're constantly changing. So what we are trying to find is something that is not static, it's, it's, it's developing, it's changing. And I think that's something that we should really keep in mind, is that when we have this sort of call for diversity, it's something that's changing, and we can't be limited to also just cultural identity. We need to think about, you know, uh, query, we need to think about also diversity of material, the way art is made. Artists are making things in different forms, like, uh, you know, it might be something that's ephemeral, it might be a performance, and we need to think about our other ways as well. So I think for me, it's sort of just wanting to bring everything down, thinking about the sort of kind of collectivity, um, and sort of questioning of how we diversify, we need to think of it as something that is constantly in place of life. So I'll just sort of stop there, because I think we well, I think it'd be more interesting to sort of chat with everyone and kind of talk about it. So I guess we move on to the next little thing. <laughs> Thank you. 
which many of us saw at the time was a much better collection than anything that any other museum had because of the type of work that was purchased. But within the National Gallery, within the Canada Council itself, the art bank was not considered to be very important because it wasn't coherent. So to add to this notion of excellence, there's also this notion of coherence. There's also this notion of what value is as opposed to what belonging is, which is familiar to everybody who's taking cultural theory. Right? Um, but what is interesting is how difficult it is within the visual and media arts to get out of these, not so much value judgments, but this axis of culture. <laughs> and Richard Hill recently wrote an article that was infused uh, as, a, as a columnist amazing intellectual and writer, but what's he writing about? He's writing about how, in this one particular show, there are weak works that are included in the show. It's a show, it's a show by famous Aboriginal artists. And wouldn't it have been better if they'd have kept those works out? And the thing is, yes, I'm not going to disagree with that, but is that what we're talking about now? You know, there's a hegemony within the cultural, within the curatorial practice that is very, you know, that includes all of us, the theorists. Queer, black, white, whatever. And that is why it's refreshing to hear the three of you raise the issues that you are at this moment in time, because something has slipped, and I don't want to name what it is, but something has slipped out of the discussion of notions of self-determination, that, that uh, were behind a lot of these moves that you're talking about historically. So I'm really interested to, my question I guess is for, for any of you or three of you, can you define, can you give us a better definition of what you think the moment is right now and what in your case is different from that period of time that you were talking about? Um, for me, in my case, what I'm thinking about it and, and what many of the folks, particularly in the Black Arts movement, what well, I would call Black Arts movement of sorts in Canada, uh, have been thinking about is looking back at that moment and trying to understand the kinds of, let's say, mistakes, or not mistakes, um, or inability to see down the road in terms of attendance and paradigms we're using. I think what's at stake right now is not the idea of uh, issues of representation being represented in these spaces, but a real look at the kinds of entanglements that we've all been engaged in. And primarily the entanglement that um, didn't also allow us to see the ways in which our practices, or the practices considered other practices, are deeply, deeply embedded in, in movements like modernism, the ways in which we're embedded right in it. We've always positioned ourselves outside of that space, and in a sense, reproduce some of these ideas around um, uh, the ability to be able to point out and see diverse works because of the icons, because of the ways in which in the ways in which they operate to gesture back to someplace outside of this nation space, but also uh, to gesture back to places or spaces in which our entanglements have not been really discussed, because we're deeply embedded in each other's presence and past, and we continue to be embedded in each other's futures. So I think that was a bit, that's the kind of discussion we're involved in now. But right? I think that discussion is a much more productive discussion than the ones that took place in the 80s. But we needed the, the discussions by the 80s, we needed the Lily and Alex, we needed you. We needed all of those discussions to take place in order to see and to imagine something different. Uh, <laughs> that might have done that. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Other questions or comments? Other questions? And we do ask that people identify themselves when you do. 
mean, I don't really know details of the implementation of Bang, but uh, what I saw was that uh, museums, in particularly you know, important public museums such as the National Gallery of Canada or the Art Gallery of Ontario, where I uh, formerly uh, worked, that where artists came into the collection, and particularly contemporary art, which is you know just one one very narrow kind of sector of what museums are acquiring and presenting and you know, preserving, that uh, generally, you know, for artwork to be publicly collected, the artist would have had to have attained, you know, some of the very highest levels of uh, accomplishment recognition already, and that the purchase by one of these major national museums would uh, signify already a kind of a, a long uh, achievement. And uh, what the Art Bank was doing was uh, visiting a full national spectrum of artist studios at, uh, at early levels and, uh, and making the investment in you know, a demonstrable way of acquiring you know, almost all the time directly from the artists uh, <coughs> works that would be held and held partly in trust for them that, that is, that if their works were to uh, gain you know, special recognition and value, that they could withdraw those works from the bank and, uh, and take the reward of that. So there was already, a, it was in some ways a uh, initiative by uh, these officers of the Can Council who were, you know, seeing the full range of you know, artists that were applying for support and aware of you know, you know, how many artists were working and how little their work was actually being served in any kind of recognition. And some of the investment also that had been very important in the past was that uh, that works were kept somewhere that might otherwise have been lost. Right. The, the that, and that's something that Brenda definitely, when yeah. you're talking about your your work and, and, and what you prize about that connection to the collections. Uh, 
dwindling funds that were being made available for these kind of programs, and uh, uh, you know, conversely, a burst of you know of deserving activity that needed support. So uh, I think that you know these questions were being posed at a time that the art bank was faltering, and uh, and when did evolve. Some of its collection. Can I, okay, can I mean, yeah, okay, I can just yeah. to say this: that they went to, uh, they were offered not to, for any private, private organizations such as the AGO is a private organization would, you know, places so, where these would be kept in a, in a way that they would get to the public. And so this kind of period of questioning uh, was, you know at a time that they were needed to redefine themselves. And I find what's particularly striking about this exhibition is that it's, uh, it's showing how the art bank uh, willed itself to, uh, to gain relevance and to uh, you know, uh, carry it forward as an example of what needed to be done. Thanks very much. Thank you. Just a comment about that. There's nothing to speak what you're saying. I think the question, though, that remains, and that's something that I think three of us have tried to address in a certain way, and we're charged with this in a certain ways, is what does the future look like? So the way says, yeah, fine, I'm not disputing that. And not even, it's, it's too easy to go into you know, the past and, and impose a type of critique. I and mean, we, we do it because it's necessary, but we're trying to see what, what can happen. And, and I think Brendan said something very interesting. We talked about a type of flex and fluidity, right? Now, this isn't just for artists and for art forms and for participation. It's for institutions. How do institutions remain fluid? And of course, institutions are remarkably um, lacking fluidity for the most part. That's their nature. So how do we, uh, and my, my question, and we spoke talking about, I guess, the notion of the imaginary. How do we also try and inflect the Canadian imaginary so that it, it can be more conducive to this, this type of, uh, whether it's diversity or what I would see is a radicalization of the cultural consciousness, right? How do we do that? And, and that's something that I think the institutions, precisely because they've had a progressive history, the Art Bank and the Council, how can they stay ahead of the curve, right? And keep doing the things that they've been doing, because you know, I know I wouldn't be doing the type of stuff I'm doing without the history of something like the Canada Council. But I also know that that doesn't mean you don't uh, critique that, right? Because you want to be able to, uh, to, to change the nature of it. I had a, a student many years ago, uh, an African Canadian student who was doing a lot of anti racism work, and people were saying to her, she said, they said, if you hate this country so much, why don't you leave? And, they, and she said, it's because I love this country so much. That's why I'm doing work I'm doing, right? We, we love it, and so we change it, and we have to take it up, take up that mantle. And that is the question that we're, we're all struggling with now, and I think it's a good question. How do we do it? I don't know. Oh, yes. Well, we got a lot of things here. So I'm going to end up with a right here. Uh, this, is um, this question about the diversifying, too, I think it also means that we can stay within the confines as well. I think we also need to be able to disseminate the work outside of the confines because then it allows, you know, that question of what we do in this space, you know, not become regional not become regionalized. And within our country, we, we, we are compartmentalized. But I think we need to sort of like allow that, that allow the accessibility to, to happen where it, ha it also happens outside of the space, to, to, to have that masses of people see the work from all places as well. I think that's really important. So that will allow more new questions. Um, I'm just going to follow up on the question. And really also something that I shut up which is really trying to um, make elastic this notion of the nation and the nation space. So to create um, a more, more of a kind of transnational kind of discussion to bring down this kind of border, a very specific kind of understanding of this idea of what it means to be Canadian or what Canadian is, right? Um, and we're a bustle with us. Come from these elastic spaces, we're in a lot of the borders. Um, are not as fixed as we would like to imagine them. And these fixities create also the kinds of issues we bump up against in relation to identities, um, or not their racialized ethnic um, queer, I mean, but the range of identities that we actually negotiate. Um, and the kinds of products that come out of those uh, relationships to other spaces outside of the space of 
think, by thinking and imagining um, different types of understandings in relationship to the nation state will also shift um, the kinds of worlds we produce, how we disseminate them, um, and how we think about the space. And yeah, we have time for one more question. So, oh, Lisa? Yeah, Gary? <laughs> Something that is reflected upon me 
so the process is working on me as much as it is I work on my own identity. Let me add to the, the notion of racialization is one that comes out of an anti-essentializing principle. So instead of saying a person is, as the Hindu says, of a certain race, it's a moment of, of becoming. So it's a pro processual thing. So um, a social condition creates race or racialized place. Uh, and a person doesn't get born into it. Uh, so uh, there's a poet, Fred Waugh, for instance, he writes in Diamond Grill, and he, he has this moment, beautiful line, where he says, in, until, until Mary McNabber called me a chain, I wasn't one. So, so what happens is that, that all the of being called into, into, a, into being is, is part of that racialized process. And it's much more effective than notions of race, because though it goes back to this, this notion of fluidity. Um, at one particular point, 1920s and before, you know, uh, Irish immigrant immigrants were, were racialized peoples, right? They ceased to be racialized and they became racialized as white in a, in a, through a different process, right? And the same sort of thing is happening you see now, different, different groups moving between those kind of categories and, uh, and racialization occurs differently. So, and, and your second part of the question around democratization, I'm not quite sure if I got the, the equivalence there. Um, my critique of the, the notion of uh, democratization is simply a very simple one. Is I don't know what that means, right? I don't know what people mean by that. I suspect it harks to a little bit of the neoliberal uh, tendency that, that I was talking about. Um, my concern with it is that, that the notion uh, of democracy uh, that I have from a theoretical space is different than what I see in a material practice or in a capitalist practice, where democracy means it's almost like a second-hand phrase around a free enterprise or something like that. Um, so that's the, the thing. So maybe we can talk after because I can we learn a bit about what you're, you're saying because I'm a little un, unsure of what um, So the beginnings of many conversations, I hope. Uh, I encourage you to continue. We're going to move out. Do you want to? Uh, anyway, thank you so much. To all Um, I'll just remind you that we do have, a, a invite you all to attend the reception, which is just at the other side of, of this wall with the questions, and that Jan Allen will be making a few remarks in that space um, momentarily. And I, to wrap up, I'd just like to thank you all for coming, and of course thank our speakers for bringing up some really important issues, which I think we're going to get um, discussed in the next few, in the next while uh, outside. So thank you very much.